Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Thinking Differently, Neurodiversity in the Workforce. I'm Lori Eccles, the host for today's webinar and director of the Spectrum Support Program at Rochester Institute of Technology. Over the last 10 years, the Spectrum Support Program has served over 300 degree-seeking students on the autism spectrum. The services provided include individualized mentoring and coaching, a pre-orientation program, sponsored social events, and consultation and training for faculty and staff. Cross-campus collaboration and referral and customized career preparation seminar courses ensure that students have the supports they need to navigate the transition into, through, and out of RIT. RIT's 100-year history of focus on career education fuels employment opportunities for students who graduate from RIT, with an impressive 95% of students either entering the workforce or graduate study within six months of graduation. However, nationwide employment outcomes for people on the autism spectrum, even those with college degrees, remain unfavorable, and job seekers with ASD often need additional support to ensure they move towards successful employment experiences. The Spectrum Support Program works with our campus partners in career services to assist students on the spectrum with learning the career planning and personal marketing skills needed to build high quality resumes, negotiate the job search process, prepare for successful interviews, and transition to new work experiences more smoothly. Today's webinar is an acknowledgement of the importance of creating truly inclusive environments on our college campuses, in our workplaces, and in our communities, especially as we celebrate Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Neurodiverse Hiring Initiative at RIT, an innovative partnership between the Spectrum Support Program and the Office of Career Services and Cooperative Education that works to connect talented job seekers on the spectrum with employers seeking neurodiverse talent. Ultimately, the Neurodiverse Hiring Initiative seeks to help employers think differently about job seekers who might be wired differently, those whose perspectives are unique, whose thinking is sometimes unconventional, those who think differently. Before I introduce you to today's moderator, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to make you aware of. Participants are automatically muted, but we welcome you to put your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. We'll attempt to answer as many questions as possible. All participants will receive a follow-up email with a link to the webinar recording. We encourage you to share this link out with anyone who can benefit from the information we share today. Captioning is being provided for today's webinar. If you require captioning, please post captioning needed in the Q&A box, and we'll share a link with you. Now I want to introduce you to Janine Rowe. Janine is the Assistant Director for Careers and Disabilities in RIT's Office of Career Services and Cooperative Education, and she'll serve as today's moderator. Thank you, Lori. I'd like to um, give a brief overview of our general topic today, and then I'm gonna introduce our subject matter experts. So when we discuss neurodiversity, we're referring to the perspective that differences in learning and thought, such as those often attributed to the autism spectrum, um, these aren't just a list of deficiencies. These are differences that often come with unique skills that can be leveraged um, to create value for organizations. So our hope today is that we can encourage employers to think more deeply about how they can utilize neurodiverse talent. And why is neurodiversity so important to us? Uh, of course, as you know, autism is on the rise, and this has created some unique opportunities and some unique challenges for both employers and for anyone who supports emerging adults. So no matter what your role is, uh, we think it always makes sense for you to think about the steps that you can take to be more inclusive of this population. And we are just thrilled to see a lot of buzz in the employer communities about neurodiverse hiring. A lot of employers are starting to realize the impact um, that a cookie cutter approach to recruiting has. So this cookie cutter approach, you're really looking for a very precise set of technical and interpersonal skills. It works pretty well for many job candidates, um, but candidates on the autism spectrum, they may get overlooked because their corners don't exactly match uh, what the employer is looking for. But they can make up for that um, with some deep pockets of skill 
that can have a profound impact on an organization. So I'm just thrilled to count you all among future focus thinkers that um, will help recognize the potential of neurodiverse employees and who want to help neurodiverse individuals shine. Our other objectives today, uh, if we could move to the next slide, uh, include demonstrating the business case for neurodiverse employees, learning about best-in-class models to support your neurodiverse employees, and the practical strategies that you can use. Uh, let's go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, I'd like to introduce our participants, those of you on the call. Um, we had 170 uh, registrants, and we asked you all about your current knowledge on neurodiverse employment. 47% of you indicated that you're beginners in this area, 39% you have an intermediate or moderate level of knowledge, and 14% of you are experts. Um, so we hope that you will all weigh in in the Q&A uh, because all of your perspectives are important and valued. Uh, we also asked you about what types of questions you had. And the highest interest areas were in recruiting neurodiverse candidates and providing ongoing support. So now I'd like to turn our webinar over to some of our subject matter experts. We're going to start with Ed Thompson, who's the director of Optimize, which is an organization that supports companies to help reach their neurodiverse hiring goals. So Ed, hopefully you can tell us a little bit about your organization. Sure, thanks, Jimmy. So I'm Ed Thompson. I'm the founder and CEO uh, of Optimize. Uh, as you can probably tell, I'm originally from the UK. Uh, we have offices uh, both in London um, and in Denver. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So we build tools, uh, digital tools, to support neurodiversity uh, in the workplace. And these are tools both for neurodivergent job seekers uh, and for employers. Um, our training products for both uh, revolve around self-paced, bite-sized video learning uh, with additional downloadable resources. And for employers, we offer a suite of on-demand training toolkits for managers, coworkers, uh, mentors, HR teams, uh, and anyone else involved in neurodiversity hiring programs or neurodiversity inclusion uh, initiatives. Next slide, please. So from the beginning, we've had a very collaborative approach uh, to our work here. Um, I think that's partly because we believe nobody has all the answers. It's by working together uh, that we can get there uh, the quickest. Part of that has been deciding to focus very much on the tools to seed and scale uh, these programs. And we work with an increasing number of partners who uh, conduct research, who provide in-person assessments, who are in-person consultants, um, who help uh, you recruit and find talent, um, and so on. Another part of the collaboration uh, has been actually working on the products themselves. And we continue to work with multiple sources to, to create really what's become almost a, a kind of curated crowdsource set uh, of tools that keep getting stronger as they are iterated with more input from researchers, employers, uh, focus groups, neurodiversity export, uh, experts, um, and so on. And I'm happy to say as well that we've, already, uh, we've always had neurodivergent people themselves uh, help to shape uh, our products, but now we have them appearing in them as well, telling stories and giving tips on topics like hiring, accommodations, management, um, and career progression. Okay, so last slide, please. So I want to talk just a little about why neurodiversity at work initiatives uh, are already underway at so many organizations. And Jen is going to talk more about how Microsoft have approached this uh, and the benefits they've achieved and aim to achieve um, going forward. I think this focus on neurodiversity at work has come uh, from two things. Uh, it's partly because of talent challenges, often critical talent challenges, uh, common to many organizations, most organizations uh, in 2018, especially those in tech, I think, with any kind of tech function, but, but also uh, beyond that. I think we can summarize these as, how do you keep your best people? Are you losing high value subject matter experts and, and spending lots of time and money uh, trying to replace them? 
how do you avoid losing talent in the hiring process? And at Microsoft and Jen can talk more about this. I know they found that some of the great employees they've hired as part of their autism program had previously applied to the company and not been successful, really proving that, that programs like this can remove obstacles to recruiting um, great talent. And then how do you encourage the best people uh, to apply? As recruiters, why do we go to MIT or Stanford uh, or RITs? Because we want the best people. And relating to our discussion today, we know that a substantial percentage of this talent is likely to be neurodivergent and may not know that your organization is somewhere where they can bring their innovative thinking, um, data analysis, attention to detail, uh, and all sorts of other skills. So I think a lot of companies have found themselves with expensive talent management, unfilled job vacancies, high turnover, uh, and also homogeneous looking teams. And, and these are teams that the overall diversity and inclusion business case uh, in the last decade in particular has proven uh, are less effective than those which include and, and, and blend people uh, who have different perspectives and who bring different perspectives. So these challenges have, have, have often become CEO level priorities now and, and not just HR priorities. And I think what's intersected with them in, in our case and, and what's led to Microsoft and others developing programs that, that can, to some degree, turn these challenges into amazing opportunities has been uh, a, a, an overdue cultural change in the understanding of neurodiversity and neurodivergence. So for a long time, you have these inverted commas conditions, uh, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD that have, have been defined by negatives and challenges and uh, in very medicalized uh, language and in a kind of medicalized societal framework and as we're now seeing these in their true light as different thinking styles uh, and with strengths many strengths of which can be brought to work uh, as well as challenges uh, this i think is is opening people's minds and to um, janine and laurie's phrase helping people think differently about people um, who think differently i think we're also recognizing that many challenges experienced by neurodivergent people whether in society as a whole or in the workplace are the result of a world being shaped for neurotypicals um, and that these challenges can often be mitigated with accommodations and, and accommodations that are often cheap and, and easy to make. So now we have Richard Branson saying that his dyslexia has been a gift. We have entrepreneurs like David Neeleman saying there's no way he'd take a pill to get rid of his ADHD. It's just been too important to his success. And we see hiring programs, um, hiring autistic people, and JP Morgan Chase uh, is one example where they found their neurodiverse teams to be 50% more productive um, in comparative testing. So I think neurodiversity at work is about tackling the core talent challenges that, that most employers and recruiters are facing, and I'm sure those are familiar to, um, to people here. We know that up to 20% of people are neurodivergent in some way. We know this is a high potential talent pool. And we know that new technology is supporting even people who have more substantial challenges and who in the past uh, have struggled to find sustainable employment. But almost every organization has evolved processes and practices that are shaped just for neurotypicals, they're processes that assume that everybody thinks the same way when we know that they don't. Uh, and we, in fact, we, act, we actively want to include people uh, who think in different ways. So the likelihood is that without intentional steps to change this and without really kind of being intentional about it, employers are just engaging with a tiny percentage of that talent pool. And it's a a fraction that is either so brilliant that they just managed to shine through or that they've managed to teach themselves to fit in to, to workplaces that are shaped for, for neurotypicals. And I think what companies like Microsoft have been doing is recognizing that this talent is out there, recognizing they need to be intentional about how they attract and hire and, reta and, uh, and retain it. And as a result, they're starting to engage with a much bigger percentage um, of that. Uh, pool, they're finding that that talent can make a great impact and they're finding that 
steps to include neurodivergent people uh, are often universal accommodations that benefit everybody um, in the team. So I'm going to hand it to Jen now uh, to talk more about Microsoft's own program. Ed, um, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, and we can skip ahead. So um, as a brief introduction, this is Jen Guadagno. I'm the Senior Inclusive Hiring Program Manager with Microsoft, and I've been working with our autism hiring program since we launched three years ago, um, April 2015, at the UN World Autism um, Awareness Day. And this slide, again, all this information will be sent out, but wanted to talk a bit about our program, um, why it was designed, the specific recruiting process, and I'll go into a little bit more detail as well. So um, to be perfectly frank, we've always had people with autism working at Microsoft. Um, this hiring program was not new to bring neurodivergent people into the organization. What we were really trying to solve for is that front door recruiting experience. Oftentimes, we see applicants who are overeducated and underemployed. Uh, so, for instance, they might have a master's degree or a PhD, but they're working at a big box retailer or a grocery store um, stocking shelves. Um, in addition to that, oftentimes a phone screen is not the most effective or accommodating way to initially screen a candidate with autism based on their communication style or um, some of the um, impacts of their autism answering the direct question that you might ask them, very yes, no, uh, without um, realizing that diving more into that question might help that recruiter have a better understanding of their skills and experience. So by changing that initial engagement model with candidates, looking at how our interview practices uh, needed to be better situated for people with neurodiversity, neurodiversity, and then looking also at the onboarding to make sure that these new employees land well at Microsoft. We do have some specific uh, sourcing strategies. So we have a dedicated email address, um, msautism at microsoft.com for candidates to apply to. We also have a specific career page for people with disabilities that want to apply to our inclusive hiring programs. Um, there is a section within there about our autism program that has some FAQs and some employee stories as well. For those candidates that do apply, I'm moving into the second column here around pre-screen. Um, for software engineer and data science candidates, uh, they are provided with a technical skills assessment, which is actually becoming a best practice in the tech sector. It's not something specific to our autism hiring program. There are other engineering and product groups within Microsoft that use this as well. What it does is it's a five question, two hour assessment where the candidate is asked some coding questions, um, design, quality assurance, and it really gives our interviewers and recruiting team some insight into their skills as a software engineer or data scientist that may not show up very well on a resume um, or within the uh, phone screen or initial interview process. So based on that, and uh, we also have a talent sourcer who does phone screens with our candidates who's received training and familiarity with neurodiversity. And based on those two inputs, we invite who we're going to have to our Redmond campus for the skills evaluation, which is a five day in person recruiting recruiting event. Uh, we're running, running them quarterly right now. We just had one a few weeks ago. Um, our next event is going to be in August, dedicated to university students. Um, so we are always accepting applications from candidates, if you would like to refer that along. The other point of the five-day program is to help build some familiarity with the company, to um, provide some insight to the hiring teams that are available, the positions, we start out on Monday with uh, manager introductions, which allows the interviewing teams to get to know the candidates a little bit better from um, a personal perspective, some of their maybe hobbies or interests, and it allows the candidates time to learn more about the jobs and the type of projects they would be working on if they were to receive an offer from a particular hiring team. 
It's not an interview. It's meant to be more informal and social. Monday afternoon and all day Tuesday, we partner with the learning experiences team here at Microsoft and they go through some modules uh, through the Microsoft Innovation Center. And what that is are those um, crazy, uncomfortable team building exercises like the marshmallow challenge, where our candidates are given, uh, they're bro broken out into teams, they get 20 sticks of spaghetti, a yard of yarn, a yard of masking tape, and a marshmallow. And the team has to build the tallest structure that independently supports that marshmallow. And what we're learning through exercises like that over Monday and Tuesday are some of those soft skills that may not come out in an interview. Things like who's emerging as a natural leader, who's more introverted and happy to participate, but you have to draw them into the conversation. And these are things that we observe in the room and then share with interviewers to give them insight into how their team dynamics might play out. On Wednesday, we spend the entire day on interview prep. So every candidate has uh, what we call a mock interview, which is a regular technical interview that anyone would have at Microsoft. The difference is it ends 10 minutes early. There's also a recruiter. So it's the recruiter, the interviewer, and the candidate. And it allows that interviewer to give candidate feedback on their interview, any tips on things they could do differently, things that they were really strong at or where maybe they got stuck. The recruiter records those notes and that's provided back to the candidate. And the rest of the day there's coaching opportunity to dive more into that feedback. Uh, we do a presentation on writing an effective resume or LinkedIn profile and how to speak to gaps in your employment. Um, and really focus on getting that candidate ready for Thursday and Friday, which are uh, interviews with our hiring teams. Um, over that day and a half, every candidate has three interviews with long breaks intentionally uh, within that period of time for people to decompress or regroup. Um, often university students will bring their coursework with them to work on. And then Friday, we wrap up with a lunch with some of our employees that have been hired from the program um, and really let them just sit down together, have an informal Q&A, ask questions about relocation or what surprised them about being a Microsoft employee. And then we wrap up the week and set expectations with the candidates that they will hear from us within two weeks, whether they've received an offer or not which is different than many recruiting practices. Uh, we wanna make sure we close that loop with all the candidates. For those that do receive a job offer, they move into our um, hiring and onboarding process. And those that will not do get some feedback about where they could maybe put some more focus, um, skills that they could work on so that they can apply again at Microsoft in the future. And then moving into the final column there on hire and onboarding. So those that are starting at Microsoft, we provide a training. Um, this is an in-person autism in the workplace uh, provided for that manager and the direct peers. We will sometimes invite in um, people outside of the team if they're gonna be working with that new employee on a daily basis. And the, the new employee knows that training is happening and they know that it is in support of them to help educate their team and their manager about autism in the workplace, autism as a culture, and how to best support them in their new job. Uh, everyone also receives a group of mentors, which are listed here on the slide. There's the manager, which everyone has a manager to like set, set out their um, responsibilities and projects they'll be working on, provide performance feedback. They have a team or a peer mentor who would know where tools are, can talk about the uh, broader organization. Uh, the community mentor is someone from the autism community at Microsoft. They're either uh, an employee with autism or they're part of our autism info exchange, which is primarily parents of children who are on the autism spectrum. And because they have that familiarity um, in autism and neurodiversity, they really become more of a culture mentor. So things like taking a shuttle to another part of campus or uh, maybe some questions about social events or getting connected with some of our employee resource groups opportunities. And then the job coach is a partner of ours um, from a social agency and they span both that home and work life. So things uh, from a home perspective around, have you figured out your commute plan? Um, have you factored in time management on when you need to wake up in the morning to get ready to catch the bus or join a carpool or drive in yourself? Um, they also work with the manager to get any feedback about 
areas that they can grow or maybe some um, communication or dealing with difficult team members or uh, difficult conversations and really there to support that employee land well um, at Microsoft in their career. So we can go ahead, slide. And this is just a little, a different view of that onboarding support circle and training that is provided for the employee. And we could go one more. And these are, um, this will be sent out afterwards, I believe. These are various videos and stories, um, both that have been written by our own Microsoft um, platforms, as well as some of the external uh, stories, like the CBS Sunday Morning story that aired a few weeks ago, or the uh, one in the upper right there, Microsoft Wants Autistic Coders, that was in Fast Company Magazine. Um, so this is just if you want to learn more about some of the awareness about our program um, and some employee stories. So those are my slides. Thank you. Thank you, Ed and Jen. Um, Ed, for sharing with us about a cultural shift in how we think about neurodivergent candidates and understanding that the challenges that may exist in um, navigating the job search process could be intentionally mitigated um, by organizations and that allows neurodivergent folks to bring their whole selves to work. And to Jen for providing a best-in-class example about how um, recruiting, onboarding, and training can be um, optimized for neurodiverse success. We'd like to, of course, move to some Q&A and start with some questions that came in from participants during the registration process. So I'd like to ask both of you, do you recommend that organizations identify certain positions they think will work best for neurodiverse candidates? And if so, how might they identify those appropriate roles? So this is Jen, and I'll say from um, a tech perspective and many of the strengths that an individual with autism would bring to their job or the workplace, um, we, we do identify that software engineers and data scientists um, and service engineers, which work, focus more on some of our internal tools, is um, often a really good fit for someone on the autism spectrum. Um, we are looking to expand outside of those roles into some of uh, finance and accounting, um, some sort of uh, program management where it's like project management and attention to detail and keeping the schedules. Uh, we don't have as many of those roles as we do. We're always hiring software engineers. Uh, so we're also trying to figure out how do we take that five-day model and flip it a bit to also accommodate people in non-technical positions. Um, from a candidate pipeline perspective, we definitely get more uh, candidates from the STEM fields who are applying at Microsoft, uh, but we do see experience across the board. Yeah, I, I can share here just from our process of, of building training in this area. Uh, the first version of training we built, uh, we had a module uh, called Suitable Roles because we thought that would be something that uh, employers would, would find interesting. And in the second version, we got rid of it because we realized, and, and you know, part of this has been really engaging with this community and yeah of course there's a strong association with with tech roles but i know sap for example you know started there and have now hired for for over 20 different roles um and when we've done our focus groups for every person who i suppose fits um inverted commas um a, a stereotype there are multiple who say you know i'm not a programmer or you know i've always enjoyed roles which have social interactions. So from the work we've done, uh, I think you might want to build a program and, and start by saying, okay, we're going to hire you know, five software developers. I think that would be a, a, a solid place to start. But big picture, I think you have to think of this like you think of, you have to think of autistic people in the same way, ultimately, that you think of you know, white people or, or LGBT people. It's very problematic uh, to generalize. And actually, I think big picture, that's even more exciting because ultimately this is a really broad uh, talent pool. You're not just talking about filling one type of role. Thanks, Ed. Um, we have another question that came in during registration. 
We see a lot of growth of programs in tech sectors which may be inherently challenging for neurodiverse employees due to frequently changing deadlines, interruptions, a fast rate of speed expected. How can those in these fields support neurodiverse employees when the nature of the job itself may be a challenge? Yeah, I, I had a thought on, on I, I suppose, similar topic um, recently. I think, for, again, first of all, you have to think of, you have to start with the universal, right? So you have to start with how do we create a working environment and practices that support pr uh, productive work for everybody? So, you know, frequently changing deadlines, um, interruptions, noise, that's not good for anybody. So I think that that's kind of where you have to, to start. And then when it comes to everybody, but also specifically neurodivergent people, I think it's really important to focus on what people can do well and then trying to create uh, you know, a, a position and putting them in a position to be successful um, on the basis of the main task or tasks that you need to do and that, and that they can do well. So if you think about somebody's job, typically there's one major task area of that job. So that might be 85% of their work, might be 90% of their work, and then there are supplementary tasks. And I think often when neurodivergent people experience challenges at work, it's not because of their, their ability to perform the, the core work, it's something else. It's a, a non-core task. Maybe they have to you know, make a weekly presentation or, or it's something environmental that, that's uh, the challenge. So I think we're seeing organizations that are, that are doing this well are, are approaching talent management in a sense with, you know, what can this person do well? How do we put them in a position to succeed based on those strengths? And, and again, that works for everybody. Part of that is ensuring that they're comfortable, they have a, a realistic, well-communicated workload, you know, manager training can, can come in there. Um, and then for neurodivergent people as well, it can be, you know, maybe there's was one task or two tasks of this role as it's typically shaped that might be challenging for you. How, maybe we can reassign those and, you know, keep you here doing what you do well in a, in a, you know, in a comfortable environment and, and, and that's how you're gonna be successful. Thank you. Um, we have lots and lots of live questions coming in and we have several questions um, about the mechanics of the Microsoft program. And I'm hoping, Jen, you could tell us a little bit more about um, how um, the program got started and how the program continues to have support um, on the corporate level and how ind the individual tasks of the um, different steps involved with the recruiting process, especially training and ongoing support, how are those farmed out throughout the organization? Sure, um, so when the program, before we launched three years ago, a few months prior to that, our executive sponsors, Jenny Leigh Fleury, who's our Chief Accessibility Officer, and Mary Ellen Smith, who's our CVP of Operations, they both have children on the autism spectrum and whether it was through employees and parents at Microsoft with children on the autism spectrum or their own experience thinking about how do I prepare my child for the world? Uh, how do I help them find a career in an area that's their passion? We really started to look at our um, hiring practices and as we've gone through a cultural shift here at Microsoft and really looking at a growth mindset perspective um, as Satya Nadella will often talk about. Um, looking at how can we be more inclusive and how can we get this great talent into our company. That diversity of thought and diversity of experience, whether it is an individual with autism or someone who is blind or deaf or maybe has a mobility disability, how do we really look at our hiring practices to really attract um, hire and retain people with disabilities to help contribute to our organization, not just for our products, um, but also just from a culture and experience perspective with other employees. Um, the early mechanics around designing the program, we worked with a firm um, called Specially Sterna, where we've taken some of their best practices, like the employee support circle of mentors, the training readiness, 
um, some of the interview accommodation and carried that forward. Um, their program initially was um, much more labor intensive and we knew in order to make it scalable for us as an employer and to be able to run it as frequently as we can and to bring these talented individuals into the organization, it was always our goal to bring everything into, into um, within our own teams. So I actually sit on the accessibility team in our legal department. I work very closely with our global talent acquisition or staffing group, um, as well as our HR partners around the recruiting practices, um, the interview, and then the onboarding and retention to gather feedback, not just from the managers, but also those employees. So some of the things that we're working through right now are about career development um, and how career, career development doesn't mean you have to become a manager, a director, a general manager. It could be expanding skills within role or maybe trying uh, a different team out. Um, those sorts of opportunities for candidates as well. I think I caught on all of your points there, Janine, but if I missed something, let me know. That sounds good. Thanks, Jen. We have another question. Um, the Microsoft program is quite impressive. I'd be interested in the presenter's thoughts about this on a smaller scale in companies that have tens or hundreds of employees and might be only looking to hire one or two people at a time. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there are some smaller employers getting into this space. Um, there is the Autism at Work Employer Roundtable, which is sponsored through USBLN. Um, and as employers are coming on board, uh, we're sharing our best practices so that other companies can learn from our experience um, across different industries as well. So EY, JP Morgan Chase um, are part of that, SAP, Ford Motor Company. So I would say really looking at your interview um, practices and what can you change in that interview to be more accommodating um, and set up a candidate for their best experience to showcase their skills. Things like allowing longer breaks in between interviews or maybe interviewing over two days instead of one. Um, we pretty much go into all of our events, whether it's the five-day program or a one-on-one -on -one interview, that whiteboarding is not expected or encouraged from the interviewer perspective. Um, that's both from the perception of having to perform on a stage as well as some, some of the other physical or neurological um, comorbidities with autism um, to really put that candidate in a great uh, way to showcase their skills with an interviewer. So that interview changing, um, there's some great resources online. Like we, you know, Ed had mentioned where uh, we utilize the optimized training uh, for managers, employees, and HR professionals. So what resources could you maybe provide online to learn about more as autism, as um, a medical condition and diagnosis, as well as how to support that employee in the workforce? Um, and then joining communities, I would say, uh, learning from other other employers such as ourselves um, or other um, communities or social agencies that also support autism at work programs. Thank you, Jen. Um, we have several questions coming in around the topic of disclosure um, for our candidates and I'm sure that we can all understand the anxiety um, that comes with disclosing any disability, but especially a non-apparent disability um, in the employment process. So I'm hoping, um, I think we're all in agreement that disclosure is a good idea, you know, for our candidates. But what would you say um, to a candidate who may have a disability, but maybe they're not necessarily comfortable identifying as neurodivergent early on in the job search process? Um, and what advantages do they have in working um, with specific autism hiring programs? So this is Jen, and I, I'll even broaden that to say any uh, candidate with a disability. By knowing up front as an employer for someone to disclose, it helps us prepare that interview to be an inclusive experience. 
um, from a neurodivergent perspective, things like I just mentioned about not using whiteboards or allowing a candidate time to think through a question or instead of letting there just be silence, ask them, do you need any clarifying questions on that? Um, can, you know, maybe do you want to write it out on paper? We recommend interviewers actually type out their questions on a piece of paper to bring into the room so the candidate can reference that. Um, because what we would not want to have happen is an, a candidate show up for an interview, have not told us that they have a disability, and then as an employer, we're scrambling to provide supports and accommodation that we could have known about ahead of time. Um, also to prepare interviewers so they are aware that this candidate uh, is neurodivergent, they are blind, they are deaf, so that you know if there's an ASL interpreter in the room, you talk to the individual, not to the interpreter. If someone is interviewing who's blind, we're gonna expect that they're gonna use their own device to do coding problems. Um, don't even think about using a whiteboard. Uh, so those kind of things that we can prepare the interviewer for as well so that they can provide a good experience to that candidate through the interviewing process. So it really helps the candidate be in a good position to showcase their uh, skills, their experience, what they're passionate about. Um, you know, if, if it's a university student, what they worked on um, through their coursework that they were really happy about and where they want to take their career. If it's someone who's later in their career, um, the opportunity to talk about some of their challenges in the workforce and how they've worked through that. Um, so it really helps us set up a great experience for that candidate and the new employee for them to disclose that they have a disability. This is Ed. Uh, I We've started to think about disclosure kind of in, in, in two types. You've got reactive disclosure and you've got proactive disclosure. And reactive disclosure, which ha has kind of, unfortunately, I would say, been, been the norm across many organisations, um, especially, you know, with, with a la uh, less understanding of neurodiversity than there is uh, now. Uh, is when somebody discloses uh, under pressure. For example, uh, their manager is saying, you know, why are you having so much trouble with, with, with this task? It should be easy for you. Or uh, co-workers are complaining to a manager saying, you know, this person's um, not engaging with us or they're not uh, conducting a task. And typically that's, although it does get you to that point where you can have the conversation about, okay, what do we change? you're getting to it through a kind of high friction process. And, and I think in the past, sometimes uh, managers and co-workers who, who, who haven't been familiar with uh, neurodivergence haven't always responded well to somebody uh, disclosing in that way, maybe seeing it kind of as an excuse, which has a negative cycle that, that other employees wouldn't then choose to, to disclose. And what's been really interesting about working with companies like Microsoft is that you're seeing a, a culture change where, you know, Microsoft might be hiring people uh, in Seattle, but you're having somebody at Microsoft in a completely different office who's, who's seeing that the organization is taking neurodiversity seriously and is being inclusive uh, to autistic people and who is proactively disclosing, who's saying, uh, I want to talk about um, some accommodations uh, for me. And that, I think, we, again, we'd all agree, is great because that gets you into uh, the conversation of, okay, well, how do we adjust your, um, your experience? I think whether it's in the organization, it's existing employees, uh, or it's hiring, you always have two levels. You have the level of how do we create a process and an environment and, and train people to have the skills uh, such that we build people's confidence and, and create almost, you know, fewer reasons to need to disclose almost. And then, but then also how do we create a culture where people feel comfortable uh, doing that? Advertising that you're taking neurodiversity seriously, I think is a, is a, is a you know, very high impact first step uh, to that, that can kind of tilt the ratio between reactive to, to proactive. Great, thanks so much, Ed. Um, there's one other question that's sort of related. How do you prepare other employees for working and communicating with new employees on the spectrum? 
yeah, that's something that, you know, we do um, in our training. And I think find is, is, is really important. Uh, it's partly because still, you know, understanding of neurodiversity is, is often limited. You know, we know that one in seven people have a, a direct kind of personal or family link to somebody uh, who's on the spectrum. Um, and those folks, you know, may well uh, know more. Um, but I think the, the overall um, basic understanding of neurodivergent, especially how it relates to the workplace, is, is typically low. So there is value in, first of all, starting with, you know, what are we talking about here? And why is this relevant? You know, why should I be spending my time as, as a coworker uh, learning about this? And when you can position this as actually neurodiversity is a, is a, a human reality that everybody thinks differently, and how you're going to be effective at uh, working with people on projects, um, how are you going to you know build your um, your own reputation as an employee within your team and, and, and beyond, um, it becomes self-evident that it's important to understand uh, that people think differently how people think differently and then what are the practical steps as an employee uh, that you can take there uh, i think that relates in in many ways to project work it could be um, little things like you know how do you format documents um, how do you work together on on shared tasks sticking to the plan uh, and so on and it could be understanding that people have different social communication uh, preferences um, not to assume somebody who doesn't use eye contact is, is, is kind of unfriendly, uh, not to force people uh, through peer pressure to join uh, the team drinks uh, and so on. And just to be more aware and, and accommodating of the fact that people have these different thinking styles, these different preferences, and actually uh, excited by the potential of, of bringing that together in a way that everybody can, can be themselves and everybody can, can, can perform. Um, to a good standard. I think, um, so this is Jen, the only thing I would add on to that, because Ed did a really great job um, in, in his answer of that is, we also tell team members to ask that employee directly, what is best for them? Um, what, how would they prefer? Would they prefer an email and then follow up with an in-person conversation? Would they rather have things summarized um, and have one conversation at once to talk through maybe issues in the job or the project that they're working on? Um, and really not putting that employee in a corner or, or treating them differently, but really working with that individual to find out what's best for them. Yeah, I think I think that's really just to, to build on. I think, I think that's so important because you know we know from neurodivergent employees, you know, that the first time that they engage with one of their coworkers, let's say on a, on a new project, can be stressful because you know they're, they're, they're maybe unsure of you know how they're going to come across of how their um, coworker um, is going to view them. And there's you know there's one company, Ultra uh, Testing, who um, you know. Are, have a lot of um, autistic QA uh, consultants uh, in their team and they've developed something called a, a bio deck and it's uh, it's kind of a a, a quick summary uh, that each employee fills out about themselves as to who they are but it gets into things like communication preferences you know how 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 should you reach me when should you expect me to respond uh, and so on and and I think things like that are, are almost going to you know emerge as 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 best practices and and, and Jen, as Jen says that you know they're doing something similar uh, at Microsoft. So you take the time to to think about um, how does this person operate, um, and then to just to you know to to make sure that you tailor um, your work in a you know in a way that um, can work effectively with them. Thank you. Yes, I think that was a really good overview of, um, on a macro level, what can an organization do to um, demonstrate that they're accepting and inclusive of neurodivergent um, individuals and also approaching the individual on a one-on-one -on -one level of what works best for them and giving them multiple opportunities to share that is important. Um, 
just looking at the time and unfortunately need to move us toward a closing. And so I'd like to ask and each of our subject matter experts what they're looking forward to in terms of innovative neurodiversity practices for 2018 and 2019, either at your organization or with organizations that you're working with. Uh, this is Ed. I, I think, you know, to some extent, looking back over the past five years, every organization who's taken steps in this area has been innovative. And I think everybody is necessarily continuing uh, to innovate because we know that this can have a great impact. We know that we can get around the challenges, but, you know, there are challenges. And these are challenges that are being worked through. This is why you know, the, the employer roundtable exists. It's why we have sessions like this. Uh, and it's why as Optimize, we, uh, you know, work as collaboratively as we do. We're involved in, you know, multiple research projects uh, to understand this better and, and, and to continue to, you know, develop better um, and better practices. I think what I'm, I suppose I'm excited to see, and I think we're starting to see is organizations working towards a, you know, the, the, the end goal, I think, the, the holistic, you know, joined up approach, whether it starts with neurodiversity inclusion training, you know, whether you start with how do we keep people, how do we create, how do we change the environment, or whether it starts with uh, a hiring program um, like Jen's. This, you know, this is never something that can be isolated ultimately to, to one part of the organization. You know, I, I have a, a friend at a big tech company. Um, he says, typically, everybody is involved uh, in recruiting there, right? So you might have seven interviews with the team. Now, I think we know that if, you know, five of those seven know nothing about neurodiversity, there's a danger of people, uh, you know, falling out uh, through that process. So I think practically, again, everybody is innovating. I think it's about finding a starting point, building momentum, building results, and then ultimately using that and having the vision to, to think about how do we scale this awareness and acceptance across the whole organization? How do we make sure that everybody who needs to uh, feels comfortable uh, proactively um, disclosing? And how do we work towards processes that actually organically help you hire and attract the best talent and, and, and make sure that that doesn't um, slip through, uh, through the net? And I think that's a journey um, but it's an exciting journey for, for everyone to be on. So this is Jen, and um, from an employer perspective, you know, both Ed and I have mentioned the Autism at Work Employer Roundtable. So for someone like Microsoft to provide our best practices to individuals and companies that are looking to create programs um, to help support people with disabilities, uh, find employment that's meaningful and that they're passionate about. Um, looking forward, we, Microsoft, and some of the other um, organizations such as SAP or DXC Technology um, are looking towards what's the next part of that program. So career development um, is really something that for our employees we've hired through the program is an area that we're developing a bit more because their career development might look different than a neurotypical individual. Um, I see up in the in the presentation right now, there's the upcoming Autism at Work Summit uh, the week in two weeks time. Um, there is some live streaming sessions that will be available, including our keynotes. Um, so a link can be provided for follow up if you'd like to register for the live streaming. Um, it's going to cover a variety of topics from an employer from a hiring and supporting employees perspective. Uh, there is also a virtual career fair that Wednesday the 25th for um, candidates with autism and there are eight employers participating in that across various industries. So if you would like to refer anyone to that, um, we, we would love to have candidates have the opportunity to meet virtually with other employers to learn more about their programs and job opportunities that are available. Janine, I just add, just to add one more thing to, to the innovative practices um, question, which is, I think it's really important uh, how people understand the, the difference between neurodiversity and mental health. 
uh, but also the the correlation and and, and the convergence. Um, and that's something that uh, obviously mental health itself has been, which is great, uh, completely kind of transformed in, in in awareness of that and and workplace best practices. And a lot of organisations have training now on mental health. Um, but there is uh, it's very important, I think, to to bear in mind that neurodivergent people uh, frequently have mental health challenges. I think often because of the, 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 the difficulties that they've experienced in the past of navigating society, workplaces, education, um, that hasn't been shaped uh, for them. And you know, some of those challenges can, can persist. So we're doing some work, we're doing some work with partners. I know some of these employers are, are, are looking at that um, too. Uh, to, to continue to develop strategies to, to help people um, be comfortable and, and, and to have kind of um, support frameworks um, to make sure that, that people can, can be successful and those can be mitigated. Great, thank you so much, Ed. So um, we're down to just our last few minutes. So as we wrap up, the first thing I wanna do is really thank our panelists, Jen and Ed, for joining us to share their expertise, their experiences, I think this has been an incredible opportunity for us to think about how we can work together to really move this important work forward. As we uh, wrap up, there's a few things, a few events and resources I want to share with you. Um, as Jen mentioned, the Autism at Work Summit that's happening in a few weeks. And in the follow-up email, you will see a link to the live stream registration for those of you wishing to participate virtually. Uh, also, the Autism at Work Virtual Career, Sum, um, Career Fair, and you'll have some information about that as well. We also want to make you aware of a resource for human resource professionals and leaders across functions who want to learn more about neurodiversity, the benefits to their organization, how they can support neurodivergent people to be comfortable and successful at work. And so that's the Neurodiversity at Work Guide for Human Resource Professionals. And we will include a link to this guide in the follow-up email as well. And lastly, we hope you'll join us again as we continue the Thinking Differently webinar series as part of the Neurodiverse Hiring Initiative here at RIT. We've posted a few Save the Dates and registrants for today's webinar will receive an invitation to register for these future webinars as well. So again, special thanks to each of you for spending your lunchtime with us today. Thanks so much.